We're delighted to be joined by a colleague whose voice some of our long-time listeners will probably recognise, George Eaton, our senior editor. George, you used to come on the podcast every week, I think down the line from the lobby back in the day. That's right, well remembered. Yeah. How does it feel to be back in our brand new studio? It feels good. It's certainly a yeah, higher spec than, than before. <laughs> the po podcast has come a long way. Yeah, we used to basically be in a meeting room and then a basement room as yeah. far as I can remember, in your day. Anyway, um, the reason we have you here, thanks for joining us, is because you helmed the New Statesman's Left Power List, which is a list of 50 figures in Britain who have a significant influence on progressive politics and policy. And it's published in this week's issue of the New Statesman. Um, so can you explain to our listeners why you decided to do this? Yes. So the idea was conceived at the end of last year when, as a team, we thought one of the defining themes of 2023 was going to be the prospects of a Labour government. Even before the local election results, Keir Starmer was the strong favourite to become Prime Minister. After those results, he's even more the overwhelming favourite. You're not seeing the Conservatives at this point make the kind of recovery that they need to, to stay in power. And that raises an interesting question, which is who are the people who are going to shape that potential Labour government, both internally, shadow cabinet ministers, advisors, and also outside the party, trade union leaders, journalists, podcasters, and so on. And I think it's a good exercise, um, a good way to map power and where it really lies, and also to, to provoke discussion and debate. Because I think one trend has been the left and Labour have been under scrutinised, really, because I think journalists got into the habit of focusing on the on the Tory civil war, in some ways understandably. And after the 2019 results, there was an assumption that Labour was out of power, certainly uh, for the next five years, maybe maybe maybe, maybe a decade or more. And I think that, that journalists are playing catch up in an extent now, that actually the people who are potentially going to be running the country from the end of, the, of next year haven't had as much scrutiny as they deserve in terms of what they do with power. OK, and it's a really eclectic list. You know, you've got, um, you know, Martin Lewis, J.K. Rowling, Aaron Bastani, Jeremy Corbyn. How did you decide sort of who went where? It must have been a real headache. I mean, we all chipped in writing the um, writing the bios, but you were the one who had to put it all together. Yes. So I think we define power in, in, in two ways. It's the ability to change policy, uh, sometimes in a very direct way um, or an indirect way, but also the ability to change minds. Who's shaping debates, who's uh, changing opinions. And that's, I think, why you end up with this quite eclectic list, as you say. Also, I think it's a, it, it's a good example of the electorally powerful coalition that the Conservatives now face, in the sense there's some people there who are radical radical socialists, Mick Lynch, uh, RMT General Secretary, Zara Sultana, the chair of the Socialist Campaign Group. No surprise to see them on the left list. But in the past, you might not have expected the likes, as you say, of Martin Lewis, Gary Lineker, David Attenborough to feature. And I think the reason why we've put them on is because they've all had defining clashes with the Conservatives. So Martin Lewis was very critical of Liz Truss's cuts, tax cuts for the rich. During the living standards crisis, particularly over energy, he explicitly said, look, I don't have solutions in my toolbox. I, you need state intervention here. This isn't something that a consumer champion mm -hmm. can solve by simply telling people to shop around. And that, I think moves him into leftish territory, at least, in terms of having a, a quite a strong economic critique of the direction of the Conservatives. Gary Lineker obviously had a big confrontation with the, with the government and, uh, and the BBC over, over refugees and asylum seekers mm -hmm. and, and has become far more outspoken in general on politics. Um, and then David Attenborough, who, who may be seen by some as a fairly apolitical conservationist, I think moved into more explicitly political territory when he said in 2020, we need to rein in the excesses of capitalism if we're to halt the climate crisis. And I think mm -hmm. when you have an economic critique of capitalism, that does generally, I'd say, put you put you on the left. Okay. And what trends did you notice when you were putting the list together? You know, was there any part of the left that you thought was actually missing from sort of national life? I think we were desperately trying to search around for cultural figures um, who might be sort of um, influencing younger people, for example. And also you said that sometimes podcasters and people who do more sort of broadcast came above the traditional columnist in this list. Yes. So I think on, on, on that last trend, I think in the past, and these kind of kind of lists have, to, have been done before, often it, they would be dominated by newspaper columnists. Mm. In, in the new Labour era, you would have had the likes of Andrew Rawnsley, Polly Toynbee, uh, and so on on the list. 
And and one trend really now is the rise of podcasts, as you say, broadcasters. James O'Brien of LBC is on there. Alistair Campbell is on there. Um, Aaron Bastani, as you mentioned, is on there. Ash Sarkar. Navara Media is very much a video-driven, yeah. podcast-driven platform. Um, and you don't have many traditional columnists on there. Owen Jones is on the list, who obviously a Guardian columnist, but um, much more than that in terms of he has his own uh, video platform. Uh, I think the other notable trend is the prominence of trade union general secretaries, often overlooked in the past. Uh, newspapers used to have uh, a lot of labor reporters, uh, but obviously after the largest wave of strike action since 1989, I think it's right that we have four trade union general secretaries mm. in the in the top 20. Then I think the other trend is there's, in terms of mapping the left now, you've got those who uh, retain influence from the, the Corbyn era. Corbyn himself is, is, is still on the list, I think, because there are still millions of people who look to him for political guidance, albeit he's at, he's at 29, a lot lower than he would have been in the past. Then you've got those who are the rising stars uh, in Keir Starmer's Labour. Rachel Reeves at, at number one, Wes Streeting's at number six. Um, you've got the likes of Bridget Phillipson and Steve Reed, mm. names who uh, will probably be familiar to listeners of this podcast, but might not certainly not to the wider public, but who are increasingly uh, significant within the within the shadow cabinet. There aren't many figures, I'd say, who can bridge the divide, if you like, between mm. the Starmerites and uh, and the Corbynites. One of the few who perhaps can is is Ed Miliband, mm. who is an interesting example of someone who who did move left with age and who said after. Uh, after 2017 election, actually, I should have been more radical. So I think but there aren't that many people in, in that space. The left has become and remains quite polarised. Interesting. And Rachel, what did you make of it? I mean, why is Rachel Reeves at the top of the list and not the leader of the Labour Party? I think, um, as our copy points out, it's because the cost of living crisis is the, the biggest issue of our mm. time at the moment and certainly will be for the next election. All signs point to that. She has um, a huge amount of experience as, economi and as an economist, you know, at the Bank of England, at the US Embassy, so she has a huge reach. And she also, within her own party, has uh, more political experience than the leader of the Labour Party at the moment. That, and her role gives her reach right across the trade union movement as well as across business groups. So she's, she just has a huge amount of influence at the moment and will be one of the biggest and probably the biggest decision maker towards the next election. Okay. And Freddie, what did you make of the list? I mean, there are, as George was saying, quite a few Corbynites still quite high up above some shadow cabinet members on there. Yeah, and I think George is right. It's about that residual power that they've still got from 2019. It's about that influence uh, among younger, slightly, probably slightly more politically disaffected now that Corbyn's gone. Um, and that, that still massively um, shapes politics going forward. I mean, if you look at someone like Mick Lynch, yes, of course, he's got this sort of hard power in leading the strikes and shutting down the uh, train network. But he's also got this soft power in terms of of uh, making strikes cool, making it popular, you know, being able to communicate in the, uh, in the media, being able to take down journalists and going viral, basically. So there are different forms of power in there. And I think one of the key differences is between the power that's uh, residing in the Labour Party and also that more cultural, social media mm. uh, influence that is actually more reminiscent of the Corbyn era. Mm. And influencers in yeah, the right. influencer sense, yeah. And, and have you had any feedback or even backlash uh, on this list? I was at a dinner yesterday with some Labour and progressive policy people and the name that kept coming up with Al was Alistair Campbell for different reasons yeah. you know some absolutely love his podcast and are impressed with his post-political career others are sort of alarmed by the rehabilitation of his <laughs> reputation as this sort of you know um <laughs> polite polite voice of of of, of reason yeah what, what what have you had have you had any feedback Rachel? um there's been some pushback I think um from from people within Labour uh, against people like Aaron Bastani, who they're kind of, you know, probably have taken a lot of criticism from. Um, I think that I've I've been asked why there aren't more trade union leaders on, on the list, but I guess you'd expect that from Labour Party politicians. <laughs> um, and trade union leaders. <laughs> uh, in, indeed. And, you know, a lot of the trade unions are actually vying for influence within the Labour mm -hmm. Party at the moment. So they, they kind of want their name on there. They want to be known as having power and influence. So, mm, yeah, along those lines, I'd say. Mm, we should say that Owen Jones tweeted the list but said, how do I get myself off this list? <laughs> Which I thought response. was a great response. Just what we yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think one of the interesting things that have come up is basically how you define being on the left. I, you know, a few people said, why have you not included Lib Dems? I think one of the key things yeah. was uh, their role in the coalition as well and their sort of economic framework as well going forwards. And I think um, on the other side of things as well, how left wing do you have to be to be on the list? Um, I mean, I, I did, we did launch it in morning call yesterday and lots of the responses 
is uh, from you know certain Labour member types and what have you is why is so many Labour shadow cabinet so far on the left because they don't see them as left wing. So you are going to get this broader debate. I think one of the problems or not problems, but one of the debates comes around, um, you know, is liberal and is li are liberals on the left? Um, is progressive, does that progressive incorporate left and liberal? Um, is the key difference between socialist and liberal? So I think these are the co some of the key debates that we sort of had and tried to manage as we created the list. Yeah, I mean, people are never going to agree on what it no. means to be left-wing. I mean, these are terms which come from the French Revolution. And so, you know, <laughs> arguably, arguably, we should have moved beyond them in some way, but we haven't. And people always like this idea that that they, they define the left in a sense. So there are people who will say, uh, radical leftists, I don't recognize them as, as part of my left. They're, they're, they're communists, they're Marxists. Then you'll have others who say, I don't recognize um, West Streeting as part of my left. You know, I don't. I don't think. I think. I think those who associate with the with the Blairite tradition are liberals. They're not. They're not social democrats. Certainly not socialists. And that 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 that's the argument that plays. I mean, Ed Davey is an, is an interesting example. We debated putting him on the list, but I do think the the Lib Dems certainly in their current incarnation are not a a left wing party. Mm. I think you could have made an argument for someone like Charles Kennedy in the past mm. being on the list because to me he identified with that social democratic tradition. He outflanked Labour on income tax. He outflanked Labour certainly on the on, on the Iraq war. So I think you could have made a stronger case. Ed, Ed Davey is someone more associated generally with with the liberal wing of of, of the Lib Dems, and that and that's why it was a surprise that he ended up in in coalition with the Conservatives. Um, yeah, and he wrote, you know, contribute to the Orange Book. Yes, he's on that side of the party, as you say. But also, I remember interviewing him back in December, and he would not criticise the economic record of the coalition. He was he was lacking lacking a reflection of why we're in the problems that we're in today. So Lib Dems will come out on the cost of living crisis quite hard, but they won't, I don't think, or Ed Davey didn't um, reflect about what's brought us to where we are today. Mm. And George, is this just the first of many lists? Yes, I mean, I, th I think we'll certainly uh, repeat the exercise. Um, it's always fun to see who's who's uh, risen, who's fallen, uh, who's not on the list anymore. And it is it is very much a snapshot of of yeah. the present moment. I mean, an interesting example is uh, when Nicola Sturgeon was first minister of Scotland, mm. you would have had her in the in the top five certainly. Her successor Hamza Youssef is number thirteen for obvious reasons. Uh, SNP's influence much diminished. Scottish independence isn't on the agenda. So I'm sure there'll be lots of movement over the next year. And I think we will be doing more lists of this kind, but I don't want to give them away here, uh, lest other people get there first. I can't believe you wouldn't give the New Statesman podcast the exclusive, George. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. Please leave us a comment. And if you enjoyed this video, give us a like and you can watch more of our videos on our channel.